Hello and welcome to the August episode of First Look ETF. I'm Stephanie Stanton with ETF Guide. It is great to have you with us. Coming up on today's show, we'll examine a pair of tactical ETFs designed to dampen stock market risk and volatility. Plus, we'll analyze a new actively managed ETF targeting stocks from South Korea. And finally, we'll tell you about a new ETF linked to public companies from the U.S. state that is the ninth largest economy in the world. And here's a hint, it's not California. We'll reveal that state's name plus the ETF ticker. But first, it is time to kick things off. We've got Douglas Jonas, head of ETFs from the New York Stock Exchange. Douglas, it is great to see you as always. Hi, Stephanie. It's great to be back. Although we're not in person this month, uh, we're still making the magic happen. Absolutely. That was uh, fantastic to be there with you in person. Uh, let's start out, as we do, with the latest update on ETF launch activity. Yeah, I mean, there, there really has not been any kind of summer slowdown. If we look at July, 34 ETFs launched, raising over $2 billion in new net cash flow. Year to date, that total takes us to 240 ETFs. We're getting closer and closer to that $20 billion mark. And all that's being helped by ETF conversions as well as really unique new innovative strategies coming to the market, a lot of which you'll be talking about during today's show. Yeah, absolutely. It really is incredible. Um, today's episode, as you said, features a wide variety of ETFs with some pretty unique investment strategies. The breadth of ETF opportunities keeps getting more and more robust. Um, how do you see it? Yeah, it really does. I mean, if we take sort of a count, right, we just passed the half year mark. We're starting to get into the end of the summer. The U.S. ETF market now has $7.6 trillion invested and year to date net cash flow almost 300 billion. So again, ETF market is doing nothing but bringing in new and interested, interesting investment vehicles, but also a lot more adoption. The adoption rate continues to grow. This week, we celebrated a very historic milestone. For the first time ever, 2,000 ETFs listed here at the New York Stock Exchange. Super exciting week to be dialing in with you. Yeah, congratulations on that. That is pretty incredible. Wow. Um, before we let you go, are there any other ETF trends, things that you guys are tracking? I mean, as we mentioned, this episode is going to be fantastic. It really shows you the depth of and breadth of ETFs that are coming into the market that capture global investment strategies, localized investment strategies, right? Something that's you innovative, unique. We're seeing this across the board. Uh, the Yield Max products that came out recently, CHRG, which you had on one of the previous shows, is starting to really pick up in conversations. Uh, the AMPD ETF, electricity, the first one ever. So we're seeing all these really unique and innovative strategies come to the market. In the last week, we're seeing a lot of interest in CLOs. Please continue to educate yourself by watching this show. Go to ETFcentral.com. We continue to put a lot of great material out there. And the latest podcast, I won't get into it here, but the latest podcast episode just went up today on ETFcentral.com. So we're doing everything we can at the New York Stock Exchange to help educate and grow the ETF marketplace. Yeah, good stuff. We'll definitely have to check that out. Douglas, thank you so much. It's great to see you. Congrats on all your success, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right, and just a quick reminder to watch First Look ETF on Amazon Fire TV and Roku. We also simulcast First Look ETF on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, and other major podcasting platforms, so don't miss it. Stock market volatility was mostly quiet during the first half of the year, but volatility is a sleeping giant that can awaken at any moment. So how do you hedge your portfolio against these uncertainties? Well, here to discuss a pair of new ETFs built to dampen risk and volatility is Chris Cook with Beacon Capital Management. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the show. Hi, Steph. How are you? I am doing very well. So market volatility, it was muted during the first half of 2023. Should investors still be concerned about portfolio risk and volatility? Yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, investors should always be worried about volatility and risk. You know, it's it's one of those things we've seen for decades now that the volatility continues to, to increase over time. Just with technology, the markets just move faster now than they ever have. And we start to see these days of, of negative days, which is what most investors are worried about. They tend to be very, very concentrated now. Uh, and that, that's what causes bear markets that, that we're all worried about, like 2000, 2008, 2020, and, and even last year, 22. So the Beacon Tactical Risk 
ETF. That ticker is BTR and Beacon Selective Risk ETF, and that ticker is BSR. These are new additions to your firm's ETF lineup. Uh, tell us about them. How do the funds work and what types of investments do they hold? Yeah, great question. So both ETFs are actually kind of related in, in a certain respect. Uh, to dampen the volatility, you know, the first line of defense for both of them is an equal allocation across all market sectors. So the 11 sectors that we're looking at out there, technology, healthcare, financials, so on and so forth, all 11 sectors equally weighted. Instead of having that market cap weight like the S&P 500 or the other major indexes out there, that gives a very high level of diversification for clients. So that kind of damp dampens some of the, the volatility that you see out there. Just some of the things we've seen in the last few weeks, technology has led the way with the volatility because it's been on such a run but the equal allocation kind of calms that down. So that's the first side. And then the, where they differ, the beacon tactical risk is much more aggressive when it comes to trying to stop the volatility. When it drops by 10%, we trigger a stop and go into defensive modes, which is primarily treasury, short-term treasuries that we go and hide, quite frankly, until the market recovers and we re-enter the market. The beacon selective risk, BSR, is by its name more selective it is sector by sector so as each sector shows weakness we will sell those sectors and as they show strength we will buy those sectors one at a time and and could that be anything i mean can you give us some examples of some of the sectors that you're looking at yeah sure absolutely so you know technology led the way uh, starting back in october so that was a sector that showed some strength so it re-entered into the portfolio from 2022 you know pretty quick but then you have some that are kind of lagging a little bit behind, uh, say financials uh, earlier this summer when we had the, the regional bank you know, issues that were starting to pop up. It showed weakness, so the financial sector sold. Uh, then as it recovered, then that sector starts to buy back in. Yeah, so it's not like you have a lot of flexibility. How do you see BTR and BSR being used inside a diversified portfolio? So most advisors that we work with out there, uh, they tend to build their portfolios around three different buckets. One is an income bucket for more immediate needs. You know, one is for a more conservative equity strategy that they, they know they need equity exposure, but they don't want all of the volatility. And then the last bucket is for dollars that they want to tap into 10 years or more down the line. Uh, so that could be much more beta or index oriented. We fill that middle bucket with both of these, these ETFs, Beacon Tactical Risk and Beacon Selective Risk, gives those clients and investors equity exposure with downside protection. So it gives them the opportunity to participate in the market you know, without any caps or participation rates or anything like that, and still know that there's a safety net built into the portfolio to try to protect them as the markets get volatile. Chris Cook with Beacon Capital Management. Thank you so much for joining us here on First Look ETF. It's great to have you. Thank you. Owning international and emerging market stocks is one way to increase your portfolio's diversification. It's also another way to avoid home country bias. Well, here to discuss that along with a new emerging markets ETF is Ali Lee, Lead Portfolio Manager for the Matthews Asia Korea Active ETF. Hi, Ellie. It's great to have you with us. Hi. So home country bias happens when investors overweight stocks from their own country. And unfortunately, it can cause them to miss good opportunities in foreign markets. How do you see things? So we're living in a very fast moving innovation world and U.S. has been driving it and consuming it. So I think a lot of times um, companies in U.S. are getting a lot of attention early in times. In time to time, the stock and valuation can actually be too optimistic or too pessimistic. And I think uh, when you look outside of the U.S., there are a lot of also as interesting companies out there and having a great business models. And I do believe that the Korea is one of the country that has a lot of uh, irre 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 replaceable um, companies and business models and grow into and enjoy this opportunity. So, yeah, so let's um, shift the focus now. We're going to hone in on your ETF, the Matthews Korea Active ETF, and that ticker is MKOR, MCOR. It is among your firm's latest launches. How does this fund work and what types of investments does it hold? There are three uh, major buckets of the investment companies that we do at MCOR. Uh, first is the global leaders. 
And second is a local leaders with a strong moat to sustain a, a sustainable growth of opportunities. And third is the companies with the corporate governance improvement. So the, when I talk about the glo global leaders, um, it actually talks about a lot of the industry uh, that includes such as battery uh, or EV value chains. And it can be also a memory sector in global markets that can um, enable AI drives. And also there are a lot of the biotech companies that the Korea has a strong um, vote on. And local leaders, um, I think Korea is one of the companies that's seeing a lot of innovations, including the retail market. So CVS is one of the companies that we own. And also when we, come, when, when we talk about the shareholder return policies, I think a lot of conglomerates in Korea are starting to implement solid and firm shareholder return policies. And now the Korea is generating about 3% of the dividend yield. So these are the examples of the investment categories. So then how do you envision a fund like MCOR being utilized by investors and financial advisors? Yes, I hope that MCOR can be utilized as one of your long-term innovation investment for the global context. So Korea is um, has spending the one of the highest R&D per capita and per GDP globally. And I, that's been last 10 years and it's, it's going to sustain, I think, in the future as well. So Korea has been a destination for a lot of hardware development, in my view. But going forward, and at this point, we're seeing a lot of signs that Korea is leading soft power, which includes K-pops, culture, intellectual properties, and also consumer brands. And I do believe that it's going to expand your opportunity of innovation globally. So I hope that Korea MCOR can actually remain as your um, key investment opportunity for um, innovation outside of US. Yeah, and my kids love K-pop, by the way, so <laughs> had to throw that out there. Um, Ellie Lee, thank you so much for dropping by. Thank you. Businesses relocating their headquarters to Texas are on the rise. Oracle, Caterpillar, Tesla, and Hewlett Packard are just a few of the big names that have recently moved to the Lone Star State. Besides having no corporate or personal income taxes, the state of Texas is ranked as the ninth largest economy in the world. Its nominal GDP outranks the likes of Australia, Russia, and even Canada. Well, here to discuss a new ETF targeting companies from Texas is Edward Rosenberg with Texas Capital ETF and Funds Management. Hi, Edward. It is great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So the Texas Equity Index ETF, that ticker TXS, is among your firm's latest ETFs. Tell us more about the fund's holdings and strategy. Yeah. So based on what you said, as the company's moving to Texas, there's no income tax. It's the number one state for Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. And states do matter, even though we think of the United States as one. So when you look at the strategy we've created, we wanted to try to capture the economy of Texas. And how we did that, that's a little bit unique, is it, it's published in a way where you can see GDP by sector within each state. So you can see the impact. So the index is constructed by using GDP within each state or within the state of Texas, I should say, within each sector to actually lay out how uh, the impact of each sector is. And then within each sector, you become market cap, right? Because nothing publishes that low and that makes the most sense. And what you tend to get is an extremely diversified uh, product reflective of the state's economy allowing it to take advantage of what you mentioned, there's no income tax for individuals, plus there's no income tax for businesses. So companies can take advantage by coming here and expand their business, but it also because of that shows that the potential for growth within the state and within those businesses can grow much more. What you end up with, as I said, extremely diversified. Now, I do wanna make this point. Most people are gonna think that, oh my gosh, it's gonna be energy heavy. Right. And if you look at our sectors, we're only about 23 percent energy, very diverse across the board. And there's actually five other sectors that are above 10 percent in weight. And so it goes to show the diversification and even more so as more and more companies move here to take advantage of not only the business friendly environment, but the cost of living environment. For example, renting an apartment here much cheaper than New York, for example, or much cheaper than LA 
or San Francisco, as well as think of all the colleges you get to hear about, or as I jokingly could say, watch football for, right? University of Texas, Texas A&M, all the way through, there's a ton of colleges that there's graduating students that create a giant workforce as well. It sounds positive. You said 20% energy. Uh, give us some examples of some of the other sectors, um, maybe holdings that we might see. To give you an, like other sectors you might see high up, they're high on consumer cyclicals, right? About 18, call it 19% range. You're also looking at, um, excuse me, industrials to be about 13%. Real estate, which makes sense, is above 10%. It's around 11%. And healthcare as well is around 11%. So you have a huge diversification of sectors. And even ones just below 10%, like technology, which is about 8.5% overall, across the board, gives you this vast diversification. And it shows you how the Texas economy really is growing. Uh, but it's not just energy anymore. It's not. It's sort of not that old axiom of what Texas used to be. That, that does make sense. Uh, bearing that in mind, then what type of investors do you think TXS would appeal to? If you think about how it's set up, right, Texas, we're saying, offers more growth. And if you look at the index and borrowing some numbers from Morningstar, right, the price to earnings ratio is actually less than the category average. And just so everyone's aware, this falls into a mid cap. It's sort of, the, it's sort of like a large mid cap right at the bottom, at top of the mid cap category in the blend. Um, it has a higher dividend yield than basically the category average. And what actually makes it most interesting is its historical earnings, if you go back and look at Morningstar, are significantly higher than the category average, almost double. And so the type of investor that would look for this is somebody who's interested in obviously investing in companies within the U.S., but ones that they feel have potential to outgrow their you know, whatever benchmark they're leveraging against or potentially going into. Because you're going to see, even though the product will tilt a little towards value, just a slight tilt, even though it's in that blend area, you're, and the investor is looking for something that they believe will outpace. Now, to give you an example, I know the markets have been funky, to say the least. Um, but if you look at the index we compare to since we've launched, it's only a month, right? it's outperformed that index by well over 100 basis points in a month. Um, and that's quite a lot. So it's the investor who's looking for something that has potential to grow over time and potentially outgrow whatever it's investing in. Sure. Before we let you go, just a few minutes left here. How do you see TXS being used inside a diversified portfolio? So if, if there's a lot of ways it could be used, right? But I think this, you know, it depends on what the investor wants to do. But if you think of where we slot and how we compare, and, and the benchmark we would compare ourselves to is a mid cap index, like a Russell mid cap or something along those lines, I would say something that we're looking to, com you would want to, you could complement that product. What you could say is you could say, hey, I'm looking for something with longer term growth potential. That's another place to invest in, something that potentially earns more dividend yield than something in the mid-cap space would also be appropriate. There's a lot of options. It really depends on the investor's goal. We will wrap it up there. Edward Rosenberg, thank you so much for joining us here on First Look ETF, sharing more about TXS. Thank you. And that does it for today's episode of First Look ETF. If you enjoyed the show, tell us in the comment section below and by hitting the like button. A big thanks to all of our guests, along with Douglas Jonas from the New York Stock Exchange. Be sure to check out ETFcentral.com to learn more. I'm Stephanie Stanton with ETF Guide. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.